Hi folks, welcome to the channel. I'm so excited to bring you the first instalment of a new series that I've planned out called Meet a Musicologist, where about once a month or so I'm going to be chatting with a musicologist, all sorts of different disciplines, all different sorts of uh, music being worked through, a big focus on junior and early career researchers as well, just to give you a sense of, you know, the huge variety of work that's going on, what it means to be a musicologist, uh, and also to talk a little bit about access into education, what got people interested, what it means to start studying music and begin researching. I'm delighted that our first speaker is Genevieve Arkel. Genevieve's just finishing a PhD at the University of Surrey, and her research examines musical and aesthetic parallels in Gustav Mahler's Ninth, Tenth Symphonies to Richard Wagner's Parsifal. So there's a lot of in-depth analysis, historical context as well. Genevieve is the winner of the Wagner Society's Young Lecturers Prize. She's co-founder and deputy director of the Institute of Austrian and German Music Research. Uh, she's an associate and visiting lecturer at the University of Surrey and City University of London. And she also works as an equality, diversity and inclusion activist and is passionate about speaking out on BAME representation in music in higher education. So without further ado, here's over to a chat with Genevieve. Genevieve, hi! hi Thanks Dan. <laughs> so much for joining. Uh, pleasure to have you here as the first guest on the series for Meet a Musicologist. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be the, the first one, especially. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations. We're speaking a week after your PhD, Viva. So huge congratulations again. Thank you. <laughs> So we're going to be chatting about your work, your various projects that you've been involved with, but also suppose, your personal experience, your journey of going through music studies, university, musicology, etc. I'm really excited to hear about both sets of things. To start us off, tell us a little bit about why or how you got into music studies. Sure. So I had a bit of an unconventional route into studying music, mainly that I started off my undergrad as a psychology student. I did music A-level and I really struggled with, I was a performer and I was a singer, so I kind of always thought I would go to music college. And because your voice takes such a long time to mature, I wanted to go and get an undergraduate degree first and then do a, a, a kind of a music college training afterwards. And I found A-level music to just not work for me. I, I really wanted to love it and I just, I didn't, I particularly the analysis and now having written a whole PhD that's basically analysis, um, it's quite ironic, really. Uh, and I, I love psychology. So I said, OK, I'm going to go get a psychology degree and then do my performance afterwards. I did my first term in psychology. I started to realize that all of my friends and the people that I connected with were all in the music department. And I was in the choir and all of my friends, they were all studying music. And I just had so much fear of not being in the right place. And I think I, I, deep down, there was a part of me that was like, I think I'm on the wrong course. I think I love psychology, I do, but I think what they're studying is actually what I want to be doing. It was, you know, this A-level course was so restricted in some ways that I wasn't aware of the kind of the wealth of things that you can study at undergrad. And so hearing this from some of my friends and colleagues, I really was quite excited to see if I could transfer over. So with the help of some of the music staff, they helped me to transition over. So I have some modules from psychology in my undergraduate and some from music. Um, and then finished out the rest of my degree as a, a music student there. So I kind of, yeah, didn't necessarily come at this the most um, natural way. But then while I was on that course, I just started to, over time, when I started to write my undergraduate dissertation in my third year, as much as I loved singing and I loved performing, I started to realize that I liked writing about music more than I liked singing it sometimes. It was a bit of identity crisis more than anything. Um, because in my head, I told myself that I wasn't an academic musician. I was a performer and I was a good performer, but I definitely wasn't someone who, you know, was good at A-level music or writing about music or history of music or analyzing music. And so it kind of took me, yeah, caught me off guard when I started that course and went, oh, actually, maybe, maybe I could be good at this and maybe I can find my way within these new parameters of what I 
new music to be. I knew music mainly as performance. And I, I hadn't really explored all of the other side of it. Um, and so I was at City for my undergraduate and their course was so varied that it kind of allowed me to try some of the performance and really get into that as well as doing courses in pop music studies as well as in ethnomusicology and trying out everything. So I could see where I wanted to fit within it all, I suppose. And I, particularly with Mahler, I, I was luckily, lucky enough to perform in, a, in the BBC proms with the National Youth Choir doing Mahler too. And I suddenly just, the penny dropped for me and I was like, what is it that makes this music so amazing? What is it that m moves me about this piece? Why does it move everyone? You know, people go nuts for Mahler too. And I wrote my undergrad dissertation on Mahler too and musical aesthetics, musical meaning. And so that kind of sparked a kind of Mahlerian trend in what I've been doing ever since, I suppose. <laughs> and That's yeah, so I went, did an academic master's and then onto the PhD program. As I mentioned, we're a week after the Viva and thank you so much for sending me an advanced copy. I've been flicking through the PhD. It looks fascinating. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your work, a summary of the thesis? Sure, I've got 300 pages condensed into a few minutes, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so this project um, actually originated as a much larger project about uh, the allusions, quotations, and references to Richard Wagner's operas in Mahler's songs and symphonies. Um, so it had a very large scope originally. As I, I think I said already, that I attended a concert where I heard this one particular musical allusion and it contains a turn figure, the four note um, kind of standard turn figure. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And the more I looked into it, a number of people have all said, this turn figure is so expressive in Mahler and Wagner. And we, I found numerous scholars all saying, this turn is so expressive, it's so important, and it's used across all of their work, that both of these composers works so extensively, but no one had ever looked at what it was trying to express or why this figure might have been used so extensively across both composers' works. Um, and so I, I was looking through their output and I noticed that in Wagner's last opera, Parsifal, he uses this same turn figure in five of the key leitmotifs that all connect to Christ's suffering, religious redemption, uh, pain, agony, uh, the healing of nature to heal pain. And then Mahler then quotes this kind of Christ suffering leitmotif um, at three occasions in the finale of his Ninth Symphony, as well as using the turn uh, frequently throughout the movement. And so I wanted to explore the idea of this kind of transference of musical meaning from Wagner's leitmotivic ideas to Mahler's movement and see whether there's a kind of, can we infer a transference of these kind of ideologies, these Wagnerian aesthetics into uh, a Mahlerian symphony. And yeah, then through all of that, I then also wanted to look at this turn figure and its expresses expressive identity outside of these two composers, but hopefully, you know, any other composers who used it extensively in the 19th century, we can also rethink the ways in which it can help to um, contribute to new ways of looking at musical expression in an individual's work. Looking through, it looks like you've also gone a lot into the history of the turn, the expressive connotations with it, sort of, I suppose, 17th and 18th century. So while your, your thesis, you know, talks about Parsifal and Mahler's Ninth Symphony, actually, it's very far reaching in terms of topic. You're covering a lot of history. Yeah, it's, I mean, it starts in performance practice, typically, because this turn figure, we all know it as a typical Baroque ornament. That's its original purpose and its identity. And what my thesis was trying to claim is that it's no longer an ornament. It's actually a motivic idea, it's an expressive idea. But to do that, I kind of had to run through a whole history of its development throughout all, <laughs> across the centuries to show how it's developed and, and show that actually over time, the associations that it gained with different, you know, different works, different contexts, um, you know, which composers used it and for what purposes. I know that Mozart likes to use them in his works actually, again, with a kind of suffering, um, a woeful expression, uh, often at the end of a kind of cadenza in the vocal lines. In contrast, in Italian opera, they seem to be much more joyful and, uh, and almost in a sighing sort of joyful sort of way. And so I just wanted to look at the different ways that it can express before then transferring that to 19th and 20th century music and seeing how that development took place. That's so interesting. I think it's a really good 
illustration that people might think that a, pro a project is, oh, it's it's this, or it's these composers, or it's these ideas, or these methods. So I suppose your, your thesis includes bits of music analysis, bits of music aesthetic, especially, and music history and critique, critical writing. It's so many different things at once. And that for me is a really nice sort of first example to have for me to musicologist, because it shows that, you know, a project is never just what it appears from the sort of title or something like that. There's always yeah. so much more to it. Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. It's I was always said it was quite three dimensional and that it's kind of got some of the history performance practice, some of Wagnerian aesthetics and history and context and some music analysis. And the analysis of my my analysis of the turn figure was rooted in topic theory. And topic theory for me was just the perfect bridge for this, the exploration of music analysis and musical meaning. Um, and it allowed me to kind of use these ideas in tandem and bring both of these, my passions for the kind of Wagnerian aesthetics and also the analysis of the turn together into one space. So it was, yeah, quite rounded in that sense, I suppose. <laughs> So obviously with your work, Genevieve, it's not just about your thesis. Well, you've been extraordinarily busy with other projects and it's very impressive. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of those. So perhaps uh, one I associate the name with uh, very closely is the Institute for Austrian and German Music Research. I'm currently the Deputy Director of the IAGMR. We were founded at the University of Surrey in 2018. So we're still quite new and shiny. But we basically, alongside my supervisor, who's Jeremy Byram, our honorary president, um, Eric Levy, and also our colleague, who's also deputy director, um, Beth Snyder, who's currently at RCM. And so we basically wanted to create a space for rethinking um, Austrian and German music. We find that commonly, um, you know, it is one of the most developed areas of musicological study. And yet at the same time, there's still so many areas of it that don't get explored because the same kind of ideas tend to get trudged out um, you know, over and over again. So we wanted to provide a space for kind of innovative and transformative scholarly work within that um, kind of canon particularly. So yes, yeah, so we're still kind of finding our feet. We have our inaugural conference coming up in September, but it's been really wonderful. And we're also currently establishing an EDI working group as well to also make sure that in our transformative rethinking, we're also looking at, you know, rethinking from an equality, diversity, and inclusion perspective as well, because that is so important um, now more than ever. On a similar line, but I suppose a little bit more developed around your thesis, I know that you're also involved with the Gustav Mahler Center, if you'd like to tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, they're another very newly founded organization. The, they were founded at the University of Innsbruck um, just summer last year. They wanted to have a postgraduate forum, um, which is not necessarily just for PhD students. It can be for PhD students, early career researchers. And so we currently have a, um, a small group of individuals who just have a passion for Mahler's work that, you know, either their PhDs focus around it or one aspect of their research happens to include a little bit of Mahler or they just like the music. Um, and our vision for it was to create a safe space for like-minded scholars and academics to come together and, and share research and share ideas and also kind of foster collaboration especially international co collaboration with you know that it's not thanks to covid we actually are quite good now at connecting with people internationally but beforehand it was quite hard to meet scholars you know working in austria or in the us who were yeah. interested in the same things as you unless you attended a conference so we wanted to kind of build some communication between people across the world working in the same field and hopefully, you know, create community and a space for non-competitive uh, sharing of ideas and making it a really enjoyable space rather than a kind of intimidating or, um, you know, nerve wracking experience being in academia. Okay, based on that extraordinary work with the Mahler Research Centre, I'd love to hear a little bit about your great work with equality, diversity and inclusion in music studies as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is something that I've only come to relatively recently. It was only in January last year that I, I gave a paper at um, a conference at City that was about equality, diversity and inclusion in music higher education. Um, and I'm a, a, a mixed individual. My, my mother is black, my father is white. So I'm a very light skinned um, person of color. And so I think I, I often go unnoticed in the industry in that sense, because I can't, I, I blend in, I look white. Uh, and so I've never really 
thought about my position um, in academia because I do look like I fit in. Um, but at the same time, I do have a very strong connection to my black heritage. And I noticed how few people, the higher up I got in academia, and as I was going through my PhD, the higher up I got, I realized how few people of color there were in the same spaces as me. And I was looking at, you know, going to conferences and I think, how am I the most diverse person in the room? This is, I, me, the light skinned mixed race person should not be the most diverse person in the room. And so I started just to speak out tentatively a little bit about how we can make music higher education a slightly more inclusive, welcoming and safe space, particularly for people of color. So that's my kind of angle for my activism is through uh, race relations rather than through more broadly through EDI. And then yeah, I got involved with the EDI Music Studies Network and I'm uh, kind of team lead for their digital communications uh, at the moment and have really enjoyed trying to create community, especially during the COVID year when it's been so hard to connect with people um, to try and you know build a sense of an online community for um, anyone interested in issues of EDI, but also to advocate for music departments. And I have been in conversation with the institutes that I work at to try and help them come up with strategies and initiatives to improve their EDI policies and to help fix the leaky pipeline and stop, you know, people falling off the ladder at some point, because we do yeah. notice that there is a shift of people not feeling like university higher education is for them. And that's what I've spoken to some A-level students at events. They often say that they, they worry that they don't look like they fit in in a department because they'll go to the open day and it doesn't look like they don't see many people who look like them or anyone who talks about anything to do with decolonization or um, you know music from their country or whatever it is and it immediately closes them off and makes them say well maybe this isn't for me and so that the kind of the driving force for what I've been trying to do is just to show people that it can be for you and to work hard making sure it's clear what spaces are available for um, particularly for people of colour as they kind of navigate some of the challenges of higher education. It's so important, it's such important work when I consider um, that every university, every education centre is going to be thinking about how can we reach people as much as possible and as many people as well. Um, and it's a sort of, it's not exactly a secret that music uh, and sort of classical music sort of as the traditional home of music higher education is famously lacking diversity or something. So it's such an important question, really. And it's ongoing work as well in the process. So it's great that the, the network is, is working with people and working with groups as well. Okay, my, my final question. Uh, so from everything we've talked uh, about so far, your experiences, your journey, and then your academic work, and then your sort of what I might call sort of academic citizenry or something like that, fostering networks, making new connections, promoting uh, the discipline, for want of a better term, really. What do you think would be your suggestion, your advice for anybody thinking about going into music studies? I think first and foremost, I would recommend doing it to follow your interests, not because you feel you should or, you know, someone's, I don't know, you're being pushed into it, but do it because you love it and use that as your driving force. I think also don't be put off by people who say that you can't have a career in music or, you know, it's not a proper job or whatever it is. Those people, they're just, they're just wrong. And it's a wonderful, <laughs> amazing space. And I think so many people feel that they would rather do a, maybe a more practical undergraduate. Look at me, dude, I went to psychology because I thought, you know, <laughs> that's a more, it was originally a more pra pragmatic choice and it was wrong. It was not the right choice for me. Um, and, you know, I think it's just about following that and making sure that you do something that you love every day. You know, those of us who are already in here are kind of working really hard to make sure that everyone feels that this is a fun, enjoyable space for everyone to pursue that passion. So um, yeah, and we, we want to welcome you into the community. So <laughs> I say just go for it. <laughs> and for anyone who's thinking that maybe academia isn't for them, particularly people of color, if you have any insecurities about whether you feel you want to pursue a career in this space, um, just to say that my my Twitter DMs or my emails are always open and I'd really love to to be able to help support you. And if you want to get in touch and have a chat, 
um, I'm really happy to try and offer some support and some guidance and some advice if I can. Okay, Genevieve, thank you so much for your time. It's been lovely chatting with you. Thank you for having me. This has been so brill. <laughs> uh, so if you watching this, you enjoyed uh, watching through, please check out the links below the video. We'll be linking to all of Genevieve's various projects and different work and also relevant uh, readings or ideas for things that we've been discussing as well. Okay, thank you so much Genevieve Arco thank and I'll you. see you soon. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye. bye. Music, huh?